in a way, this presentation somewhat continues from, from last week. Last week, we talked specifically about the uh, biospecimens and data for research and issues about the identification and when is research involving human subjects from a regulatory point of view. Obviously, all the data we collect is, is about human subjects, but from a regulatory point of view, uh, if, the, if the data or biospecimens are de-identified, then that could be considered non-human subject research and does not need to go through a full board IRB or does, uh, are not subject to regulations. And then we dealt with the category of exempt when again, it's research that involves research involving human subjects, but because of certain criteria that also doesn't need to go through full, full board IRBs. So this week we'll talk about the, um, the storage, issues regarding the storage of biospecimens and, and the data, informed consent for biobanking. Uh, we'll talk about the important issue of sharing of biospecimens and the data, and what role do research ethics committees have in regards to biobanking and what are the challenges for research ethics committee? So why don't we start with um, a few questions just, uh, just to get us going. So scan the code or go, go to this website here. And I just wanna ask, start off by asking some questions analysis of individual level data from multiple primary studies, select all that apply. How many people have voted? Five out of six. And um, all right, well, the answer to the previous question was all, all, all the choices. So essentially, the importance of this question is that being able to share data uh, gives you more information than from the individual data set itself. Um, so all these answers would be acceptable. So the next question, a primary concern when individual level data are shared is that participants privacy, uh, let's see, right, is, is, is um, protected. And, uh, and and the answer and the answer is true. Uh, this th this question is a no brainer. Essentially, the major issues, and we'll talk about this more. With uh, the major issue with sharing data with other institutions and other countries regards uh, privacy and it needs to uh, protect your own uh, country's individual data privacy laws when sharing information uh, with other institutions and especially with other countries. Okay, good. It is necessary for primary researchers, meaning the researchers who collected the data. Uh, so which of these um, answers apply? Receive appropriate recognition for producing data sets, participate in any secondary analysis of data sets that they have produced, uh, receive acknowledgement and publications, a secondary analysis, be included as authors and publications 
a secondary analysis of the data sets, which ones apply. And I'll give you a hint, it's not all of them, okay? Okay, four, four people have participated, uh, five, okay, uh, six. All right, so the correct answers are one and three. They should receive appropriate recognition and acknowledgement. Um, they uh, do not necessarily need to be included as authors unless they participate actively in the secondary research itself. But usually uh, all they, uh, if they just share the data sets, uh, then they should be acknowledged. Um, journals um, now require authors to disclose what would be the process of sharing their data with anybody else who wants to have access to the data. Um, are they gonna deposit their data in a uh, repository uh, or uh, upon uh, request, will they, will they share the data with other investigators? So essentially journal editors are requiring that there be some kind of process set up for all authors to share their data with whoever requests to share the data. Okay, the identification of individual level data is consi considered sufficient in it of itself to minimize all potential harms of data sharing. True or false? The identification in it of itself is sufficient to minimize all types of harms. Okay, first two says false, three. All right, why, why is that? Why, why is the identification not sufficient to prevent all harms? The correct answer is false, why is that? What other types of harms could occur? Anybody? Sometimes you yeah. need to identify the data. The, the issue is that if the individual data are de-identified, no harm could occur to the individual him or herself. However, as we discussed last week with the Havasupai tribe, there could be group harms, F harms to the tribe or the ethnic group as well. Um, so you as an IRB, even though the, um, the data will be de-identified, you need to determine whether data are being collected about a certain group, a tribe, ethnic group, uh, or race, uh, and, and hence the identification in and of itself may not be sufficient to prevent all types of harms. Okay, good. Broad consent to data sharing, select all that applies is becoming increasingly, increasingly widely accepted, can be ethically acceptable if accompanied by appropriate consent processes, may need to be supplemented by independent evaluation of specific data access applications. Okay, all right. Um, Okay, 
um, all of these answers apply. It is becoming increasingly widely accepted, though uh, I'll go over other approaches. Uh, is, um, is acceptable if there's appropriate consent processes and may be supplemented by regulations involving accessing the data from the biobank itself, and we'll go over that. Okay, it is not necessary, it is not considered necessary to inform research participants during the consent process that their data will be shared. And that's obviously it's 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 false. They need to be told about plans for sharing the data. Okay, so that's just a few questions to um, warm up this group. So uh, biobanks is uh, becoming um, increasingly a, an important topic. And we see here, it was rated number eight out of the top 10 ideas. And this was uh, back in 2009. So it's uh, uh, becoming more and more uh, widespread as an important issue. Um, so, uh, oh, well, uh, right. So essentially uh, two, two developments have uh, uh, prompted the, the establishment of biobanks, one, the so-called genomic um, revolution, if I could, um, whoops, um, sorry about that. Um, oh. Right, the uh, genomic revolution and the development of information technology and bioinformatics uh, has uh, uh, prompted the uh, or spur the development of biobanks. And essentially, what is a biobank? Uh, well, it has been defined by many authors, institutions, societies, and organizations in many different ways. And one general definition is that it represents an organized collection and storage of human biological samples and associated data of great significance for research and personalized medicine. And so um, types of biobanks, there's many different types of biobanks. There's tissue types, uh, biobanks defined by its purpose, um, also ownership, academic, research institutions, hospitals, um, pharmaceutical companies as, as well. And uh, to be even more specific, uh, biobanks could be considered to be uh, population-based biobanks or disease-oriented biobanks, so like uh, cancer biobanks or biobanks for a particular rare, rare disease as, as well. Uh, this uh, next slide shows other classifications of biobanks, and we talked about this last week. Uh, again, a cancer biobank, uh, cord biobank, stem cell biobank, blood banks, uh, defined by the type of uh, specimens, uh, DNA bank, 
California biobank. So the term biobank entails uh, many, many different uh, cla classifications. Um, also, there's uh, many different types of biobank networking and the major reason for networking is related to one of the questions that was asked just previously. Uh, it's, it's a means for sharing the data between the biobanks to increase the sample size and hence the statistical power of the of the results. And uh, this is one of the largest biobanks in Europe. There's a, a, a biobank network between the Middle East, Europe, and Africa um, as, as, as well. Um, so um, other examples of specific examples of biobanks are shown in this slide. This is a genetic alliance biobank of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which obviously has been in the news recently for other reasons. There's the um, UK biobank um, and uh, Let's, uh, and then there's the, um, have anyone um, heard of the uh, entity, where is it, uh, 23andMe Biobank? That's a commercial entity. Uh, let me um, get that. Uh, There's an entity called 23andMe uh, in which it's a company that collects your saliva and tells you some information about your genetic makeup and also ancestry, um, but they collect the um, specimens and they also do important research with the information. Uh, this is the um, uh, screenshot of the website for the UK Biobank, which uh, initially enlisted 500,000 people from the UK. And uh, this is the uh, Qatar uh, Biobank as well. Uh, Saudi Arabia has um, several biobanks and there's several biobanks in Jordan and Egypt as well. So this uh, slide shows a uh, general schematic of a biobank or a tissue repository. Essentially, it consists of three major parts. We have the specimen sources that are stored in the repository or the biobank. And then we have the recipient investigators. So there's many different sources uh, for the specimens. One, um, one way to collect specimens is to go to the public and ask healthy individuals to donate their specimen to the um, biobank. Um, one could obtain specimens from patients uh, in the hospital. Um, or one could obtain specimens when people enroll in a specific study and they're willing to 
give additional samples for storage in a biobank. Uh, and the, well, um, in just a few minutes, we'll talk more about the management of the biobank itself. And then, I mean, the purpose of the biobank is to do research. And then we have the so-called recipient investigators. Now, the specimens and the data are stored in the repository. The data and the specimens are stored in a de-identified manner, but the um, management of the biobank keeps the code that links to the individual participants. So it's not irreversibly de-identified. And the reason for that is that they may want to go back to the participants and get more health data, uh, or they may want to go back to the participants to ask them if they want to participate in other types of studies, or they may want to um, go back and contact the participants in order to return any important genetic results. So the biobank, again, maintains the data and the specimens in a de-identified manner, um, but they keep the code that could link back to the individuals. Now, the recipient investigators, when they ask for access to the data and all the, or the biospecimens, they obtain the data and the specimens in a de-identified manner, and they do not obtain the code that links back to the individuals who donated their data and biospecimens. So let me ask you the question, are the recipient investigators doing human subject research? Uh, people, I'll call this a body poll. Thumbs up if you think they're doing non-human subject research or, or thumbs down if you think they're doing human subject research. Or, and a neutral position is not sure. So how many people think that if the recipient investigators are obtaining de-identified information, they're uh, doing non-human subject research. So we have one thumbs up, one thumbs down. So again, thumbs down means they're doing human subject research. Thumbs up means they're doing non-human subject research. Okay, all right. Um, so, if they're getting de-identified information, they're doing non-human subject research, or they're not doing human subject research because they're getting de-identified information. So they're not involved in research. I mean, they're not involved in human subject research. 
because they're getting de-identified information. And they were not, not involved with the collection of the biospecimens. They're just getting de-identified information and uh, essentially all they need to do is confirm with the IRB that indeed, because they're collecting de-identified data, they're not doing human subject research. So is that, is that clear discussion? Yes, it is. Okay, what about other people? You're allowed to unmute yourself. It's okay. But all these people, they receive, they signed the consent form in the beginning, right? When they submitted the sample. Okay, well, that's a, that's a, a good question to ask. Um, they, um, um, well, uh, that, that is a good question to ask. So yes, originally, um, these individuals submitted a consent form and we'll go over the different types of consent. Um, and they discuss about data sharing in the consent form. Uh, but let me ask you something. Uh, let's say they and we uh, we brought this up last week about broad consent. One of the concerns about broad consent is that what happens if they say no? They they don't want their data to be used in research. And they say they don't want it shared. Now, you have the data and now you give it to people de-identified. Is that appropriate? No, it's, it's no. inappropriate and uh, the, the subject can has the right to withdraw any time from the studies or from even uh, keeping the sample in the biobank at any stage of his life. Right, well, they could, uh, they could withdraw it, right. Um, and that's, um, uh, now, if you, um, the, it's interesting that um, some people um, say that um, uh, one concern about broad consent is uh, be careful about what you wish for. Now, originally, before broad consent, uh, we would store health data all the time and specimens. And the issue is, uh, uh, could we use that data um, retrospectively? And IRBs have taken, uh, or some IRBs have taken the position that one could um, uh, use that data if it's de-identified. But now, if you're asking for broad consent, and the individual says, no, I don't want to participate in research. And you have that data anyway, because you're, you're storing the data. Uh, some IRB says uh, you could still use the data if it's de-identified. But I agree with you. If they said no, they don't want their data to be used in research. So now you have obtained from the individuals 
their desire that they don't want their data stored in research. The bottom line is each, each um, IRB, or more importantly, each uh, country needs to have uh, regulations regarding the access to data, especially if they're using a mechanism of broad consent. Um, so that needs to be clarified at the na national level. Um, so uh, now, if, if the individuals have given broad consent and in the consent, it talks about issues about the identification, uh, then uh, if the investigators are obtaining if they're obtaining de-identified the information, then it's um, not uh, considered to be um, uh, human subject research. So having said that, um, let me um, skip these slides here. Right, so let's, um, let's um, go over this. Um, Let's um, review a case study. In the, um, in the chat box, I have case one. Does everyone see that in the chat? Right, so I heard some of your conversations, um, so I think um, you are all bringing up some good concerns. You see the uh, case on my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So what um, were your concerns about um, storing the samples that were stored with prior consent? Any concerns? Tommy can uh, read the comments. I'm sorry. No, Tom had took some yeah. comments there. Uh, so we, we were wondering whether broad or specific or tiered consent was obtained uh, and, and whether the, the patients um, consented to future genetic research. Um, and then we were discussing whether even with prior consent, depending on what that consent contained, it could lead to lawsuits if they discover a genetic issue. Um, and then we we're also discussing about whether um, because it was looking at um, uh, responses, uh, genetic eth um, ethnicity and treatment responses, whether there should be any ethical issues about sharing profits. Yeah, the, the other issue is that they have been, even the people who were consented, they were consented for cancer research alone, and they were not consist consented for other type of studies. So, um, so, they, 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 uh, we will have problem if we goes, go for ethnicity and drug response. And uh, even for going for cancer research, uh, we cannot use the data um, unless it is specifically clearly stated that it's for cancer genetic study. I mean, I mean the statement itself. I mean, if the Has, consent. It has to be an informed consent in details about what the patient has has to go for. So the concern here is that we can get into lawsuits or problems uh, in terms of lawsuits, in terms of um, uh, financial consequences, and if this research happen to succeed and produce income. Now we have almost uh, the same consent for the same for the second one, which is uh, the same, like uh, consenting the people without prayer okay. consent. Okay, all right. The only uh, between one and two is that one we might be able to get away with the cancer, and but I don't think we can get away at all by ethnicity and drug response. 
Okay, so so I I agree. The major issue is um, how how broad was this initial consent? Um, also, even the even though it says here uh, prior to 2000, no consent for storage was obtained, but they they were storing it anyway. Okay, so you need the consent for storage and you need consent for the secondary research. And then it all involves uh, what type of um, secondary research we're, we're talking about. Uh, so I agree with your concerns. Now, having, having said all that, if the now something we were just talking about, uh, should the IRB approve the studies and any conditional requirements. So what happens um, if, if the um, investigators say, okay, no problem. In order to uh, examine the genetic basis of certain cancers, we, we don't need identifiable information. So now we're talking about non-human subject research. And so uh, if the investigator says, we don't need identifiable information, so are you gonna ask them to recontact the participants? There is uh, non-human subjects, so it's okay. Uh, you, you mean if the data is, the, uh, if we decide to take de-identifiable data? Identifiable, yeah. Yes, right. If the identifiable, we still have the concern that they are studying genetic data and people can still be identified by uh, DNA, DNA. But, but as, no, we, no, ended, uh, as uh, we understood that uh, the identified data will be safer. Well, if it's the identified information, it's non human subject research. It is, but the problem with the genetics and DNA studies that you can i it's it's the, the genetic itself and the dna is a is a method of identifying people we identify criminals by dna yes. and we catch them on the basis of dna we identify uh, parents by dna and children by dna that's only because you have the dna to begin with exactly you have to set dna yeah the i dna I in and of itself does not identify people. You have to, or I mean, you have to match it up with previously identified DNA. Yes, that's true. It's a true statement, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, so, um, so again, if it's the identified, then, I mean, the IRB could say, uh, you know, uh, do it without identifiers. And um, a lot of uh, people also mention about profits, other issues in the consent form. So what um, um, what I like to do now is- uh, uh, Professor Henry, can I just ask a question? So when we're yeah. talking about identifiers, we're there, we're, we're only really talking about their name because uh, date of birth, for example, you can't make any sense of that unless you have a separate database that links a date of birth to a name. The, the same argument Dr. Cowler was, or the same discussion point Dr. Cowler was making with DNA. Um, you know, you, you, they, they are potentially identifiers. So, so essentially, it's, it's only the name because uh, a date of birth you would need access to a registry that contains that that links to the name. Well, I mean. Um, uh... For data to be de-identified, you need to um, strip more than just the name. You have to eliminate, uh, we talked about this last week, the medical record number, the address, the birthday, uh, uh, and uh, national ID number. Um, so it's a uh, collection of data that has to be stripped from the 
um, biospecimens or the data itself in order to be uh, perfectly, if I could use that word, de-identified. It's more then, than just the name. Yeah, I understand that. But then, you know, mobile number, um, Emirates ID, uh, date of birth, they only make sense, uh, the same as a DNA sequence, genetic sequence only makes sense if there is a database somewhere that, that links that data to a person's name. So it would be the same with uh, genetic material that you can never truly de-identify the sample. Right, yes. Um, uh, now, theoretically, if you merge very large genetic data sets, theoretically, you could re-identify the data. But that's only if you have access to multiple large data sets. It would be possible to re-identify DNA data. Who belongs to the DNA data? But just having DNA in and of itself, you can't re-identify uh, the individual if you stripped off all the identifying information from that data set. So, um, what if you put that data in a data bank and compare it with other da other data which is saved for other purposes? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying if you have access to large data sets and also public records, uh, it's been shown that one could re-identify the data. But uh, right now, that's largely a theoretical concern. Uh, and uh, uh, when people are accessing small data sets, that's not gonna be possible. Uh, now, having said that, let me, um, I think it's probably instructive to um, all right, the, what do you see on, on your screen? A consent form? Um, hang on. Henry, please share your, share your screen. Yes, right, right. Let me... Uh, Yeah, my, I have to go to another, um, right, okay. So now, now you see, this is the consent form for the cut-up biobank, okay? And this is gonna go over a lot of issues, okay? Um, so why, why we are inviting you, uh, let me, um, all right, so uh, what sh should you know? So important issues in the consent form, uh, why we're doing the research, uh, essentially uh, vital uh, health research for, in Qatar, uh, and it talks about the samples will contain DNA, okay? Um, and how long? Uh, more than 20 years. So it's important to give the length of time, how many people, 60,000. Um, and if you agree, then you'll have all these um, certain types of medical tests and examinations, uh, and then um, they'll tell you the type of materials they're going to collect. Uh, and okay, now about risks. There are no expected 
major risks. They talk about major risks, uh, discomfort from the blood drawers, uh, emotional pain. If you discover you have a health problem, identify through the study, meaning the initial assessments. Uh, and so let me get down here. Uh, uh, it's also possible that we might find some genetic traits associated with risk of disease. Uh, now, now here they talk about although your genetic information is unique to you, you share some genetic information with blood relatives, okay? And genetic information from them could therefore be used to help identify you. Um, and information from you could help identify them, okay? Um, and they do talk about that um, people may develop ways in the future to link your de uh, genetic information in our databases back to you. So in the CUTA consent form, they do bring up this issue about re-identification in the future. And that is possible um, in, in the future. So, uh, and now I've seen other consent forms in other biobanks and uh, like in the UK biobank, they don't bring up this possibility about that in the future, okay, um, linking the genetic information with other databases could re-identify you. Okay. Uh, so the uh, Cutter Biobank does bring up that possibility. Um, and uh, now they also talk about uh, some genetic variations can help to predict future health problems uh, and this information might be of interest to health providers, life insurance companies, and others. And um, and and they do talk about that if if it could be identifiable, then uh, that could present a privacy risk. Uh, and, um, and, and then they also talk about the issue of it's possible that genetic traits yes. could, they talk about this issue about associated with your group. And they talk about group harms and harmful stereotypes. So if, if you belong to a certain race, ethnicity, or sex, we're uh, talking about harms to the, to the group itself. Uh, and uh, then they talk about, could the research be good for you? Um, and, uh, and they talk about, and we'll talk about this as well, they talk about uh, identification of potential pathologies, disease risks. You will be referred to a specialized clinic. So they're talking about returning results. Mm -hmm back to the individual. Now, in the UK biobank, 
consent form, they say, we're not returning results, okay? We're just not going to do that. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes as well. Uh, and uh, let's see now. Uh, oh, we'll make, now here they talk about confidentiality. Uh, we'll make every efforts to secure the information about you. This includes a code, okay, instead of using your name and we will not identify you personally in any reports or publications uh, that uh, about this research. However, they say we cannot guarantee complete secrecy, but we'll limit access to information about you. Okay. Um, and, um, oh, and then they talk about samples we share with other researchers and they talk about samples we share with other researchers won't include information that identifies you. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, so they, they, they talk about that to researchers doing secondary research, they're not going to share identifiable information. Okay. And, uh, and they say, you don't have to join, you don't want to, and uh, what else should you know? Uh, so, and that's, and that's the uh, consent form from CUTA. And CUTA actually has a, a very comprehensive consent form. It talks about the DIA identification, the coding of the information, sharing with other investigators. Uh, they don't talk about, um, they don't talk about commercialization, profits. Um, they talk about returning results uh, back to the back to the individual. Uh, so uh, that's something to consider if you get into the uh, biobank uh, business. Uh, so let me uh, continue with, uh, let's see where I was. Um, so any questions about the uh, consent form? There's, oh, well, let me, um, so essentially when you're doing the um, biospecimen research, you need to, um, um, it, Essentially, uh, when you're doing secondary research, when you obtain the specimen, as I said before, previously specimens were obtained in the midst of providing clinical care and you're storing leftover samples, or you obtain samples for an individual research study. However, that gets into a lot of problems on whether one could use data obtained for one research study or data obtained from clinical procedures, whether one could use that in secondary research. And one way to get around the problem is to use the vehicle of uh, uh, broad 
broad consent. Uh, however, uh, there's other types of consent that could be obtained in addition to the concept of broad consent, okay, which maximizes the uses, the use of biospecimen, there is this concept of tiered consent where individuals could be given a menu of options, range of diseases, whether uh, the secondary research study involves an illness similar to my illness, or it could be a range of diseases. It could be a choice between using only de-identified data or coded data as well, um, and whether they want to be recontacted as well. Let me uh, also bring up this concept of dynamic consent, which um, was a topic in one of the articles I disseminated. So essentially the concept of dynamic consent, uh, a lot of people are having uh, problems with the issue of broad consent because it's really, when you think about it, how informed is broad consent when the future research is not specified. And so people are now coming up with this concept of dynamic consent where via a website, uh, individuals could be recontacted for future research or essentially the biobank um, uh, reveals what kind of research is being done with the biospecimens and uh, the participants could have access to the website and see what kind of research is being done on their samples. And if they see a research study that they say, now, wait a second, I don't like that research, they could call up and say, I don't want to participate in that study. Also, participants could now see the general results of the research that they have participated in um, with, their, with their samples. So this whole concept of dynamic consent where you keep in contact with the participants is considered to be more ethically appropriate uh, to be a focus of a, of a biobank. So eh, there are now different um, um, choices. And in fact, I think uh, I said last week that uh, we just finished up doing this survey of, of the public in Egypt, Sudan, Jordan, and Morocco. And in, and in the consent, I'm sorry, in the survey, we asked participants their choices. Essentially, do they um, agree to broad consent or do they, would they rather have tiered consent or would they rather have dynamic consent? Uh, so we're actually asking the public what their choices are in regards to uh, giving their consent for future research and we're busy analyzing the, um, the data now as we, as we speak. Um, so this um, consent issue is, is very important. Uh, and uh, what I have here is additional uh, information in the consent form. Well, uh, need to always talk 
about uh, privacy, risk, the purpose of the uh, collection, also the type of research to be conducted. And as you all picked up in the previous case, it just said future cancer research. It didn't mention about ge uh, genetic research. Um, you need to put down the right to withdraw whether results will be returned and if there are plans for any recontact. Uh, so let's um, uh, continue on. Uh, let's, uh, oh, we already discussed this. So let me, um, let me switch gears a little bit. And so, uh, so here we have on this slide, key concepts of biobank development. We have data management, ethical legal issues, quality assurance, and then we have this term governance, uh, which I find to be a very interesting term. So uh, let, me, let me ask you, um, if I asked you what is meant by governance? If I did an interview, why don't you write down in, in a short sentence, if I asked you what is meant by governance of a biobank, what would you say in a short sentence? A set of regulation and laws introduced by the government, okay? Okay, regulations to control functions. Management of the samples from a medical legal ethical perspective, secure the safety of data usage, okay? The oversight mechanism. Okay, all right, yeah, yeah, write, write that down. The oversight mechanism, yes. I can't access the... Uh, oh, okay, all right. Put it, put it in the chat box. All right. Scientific infrastructure. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's the um, a good. That's a good start. So, a good governance framework should define the organizational stu structure of the biobank for daily management and oversight. This framework usually includes lists and descriptions of the biobank's personnel, committees, policies that are required to enable the correct functioning of the biobank. Um, and so uh, the reason why I bring this up uh, as part of the um, biobank studies that we just finished in my research group, we interviewed direct, uh, directors, or we interviewed, yes, uh, key stakeholders managing biobanks. And I asked them, what is the governance? And a lot of times 
I just got back. Oh yes, we have a director. We have the um, person uh, in charge of the hospital managing the biobank. I didn't get the concept that it's essentially consisting of the regulations committees that provide oversight to the many different processes of, of the biobank. Now, in this slide here, I have all the major issues involved in managing a biobank. Um, so we have here ethical principles of informed consent and privacy protection, uh, managing the quality of the uh, storage of the biospecimens, funding issues, secondary use by researchers, material transfer agreements and data transfer agreements when you permit access to the biospecimens, return of results, commercialization, uh, storage of samples uh, for um, uh, forever, community engagement, public learning and understanding of science. So let me ask you something. Um, from this whole list, okay, uh, why don't you use your annotation tool and why don't you circle which of these issues should a research ethics committee be involved? The first one. <laughs> oh, I'll we'll circle it. Okay. Use your annotation tool. Or just, or just circle the first word. Anybody else? Any other issues? What about the commercialization? <laughs> well, why you want to circle it? Yes. Yes, please. I don't know how to use it. Yeah, I don't seem to have an annotation tool. Unless you I'm... don't have an annotation tool? No. Oh, yeah, I do annotate. Okay. Maybe. Uh, yeah, on, on the top. Yeah, click on the top. Okay, good. All right, commercialization. Any other issues that public learning, understanding of science, funding management, or underline it? Secondary use by researchers? Material transfer agreements. Okay. But I right. can't tell it. Anything else? Return of result in case of genetic thing. Okay, all right, good. And the quality of biospecimen management? Uh, should an IRP be involved with that? Yeah. Don't you expect them to give you a quality Yeah, may maybe not, maybe not. Yeah, right. You could you could tell from my tone of voice. <laughs> okay, all right. And uh, uh, what about this issue here? Should a biobank engage the community? 
in the governance of a biobank. and how the biobank is managed. Should there be community involvement? Or not necessary to engage the community? Well, you just did a study in Egypt and Sudan, I believe, and what else regarding the questionnaires about the consent forms? So not to do the community engagement? Okay, right. You may want to engage the community regarding consent forms. Uh, so I, I, um, you may want to engage the community regarding what type of research will be done. Engage the community in terms of um, uh, return of results, commercialization. Uh, and and also public learning. So there is a movement now to have community engagement with the workings of the biobank. So who are the major stakeholders? I think community engagement is important in order to uh, for them later to participate to, to uh, like um, they they won't mind uh, uh, having their specimens used in research. Um, so if they engaged in the process of um, like uh, establishing the biobanks and uh, right, yeah. So I mean, if you're asking the community to donate their samples. I think it, uh, you would have more buy-in if you have uh, uh, the active engagement of the uh, community as well in managing the biobank. And as you can see here from this list, um, it's, it's more than just informed consent. We have funding issues, uh, what kind of secondary use by researchers, uh, what's the makeup of the MTA and the DTA agreements, return of results, commercialization, and also educational efforts. Uh, so the major thing I wanna get across with this slide is that one, there's a lot of issues involved with the governance of biobanks and the other issue involves the community engagement. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, governance, let me um, actually, let me see if I could, uh, uh, it's, uh, oh, you can't, uh, uh, well, wow. when I, give you the slides, the uh, Mayo Clinic um, has a lot, in fact, uh, yeah, let me uh, actually, let me just show you this. So at the Mayo Clinic, they talk about governance and oversight. And number one, they talk about the involvement of the IRB. They have a biospecimen trust oversight group. They have a biobank access committee uh, and, uh, and uh, so they have a separate committee regulating access issues. And then they have a community advisory board 
network. So they have active engagement of the community um, on, on their website page regarding governance and oversight. So uh, let's uh, let me get back to Uh, Prof. Henry, what is the role of the legal team? The this? legal team. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the, um, well, what would be the role of the legal team? I mean, if there's any medical legal implication, if there's any conflict, against the decisions made by the IRB. Oh, you mean the legal team and the IRB? Yes. No, no. I don't, I don't see where the two would intersect. I mean, there's legal issues with a biobank. Um, I'd be the last person uh, you want to ask about that. Um, but the... Um, uh, but in terms of the legal team and the IRB? Yes. I'm not, I'm not sure about, uh, I, I don't, um, what, I, I tell saw me in what, the, what you're thinking about. No, I saw in the medical, in Mayo Clinic, uh, the listing of the legal and, one of the sections. So I was wondering what was that? <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure Biobank has, has a legal team, but um, I'm not sure how that would intersect okay. uh, with the IRB role. It's okay, I'll have a look at it later. <laughs> okay, all right. A legal, person, a legal person can be part of the committee, part of IRB committee. Somebody has a background in legal? Well, it could be, it could be, but um, yeah. I, I'm not sure what- They require uh, the layman, also they require a legal person, background in legal, for example. Okay, and um, I'm, 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 I'm sure that's fine, but um, uh, as you can see, I mean, I guess you may want to have a legal person for return of results and um, I guess you want to make sure the operations can conform with national laws. Uh, I mean, that's fine. But other than that, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot that the, um, I mean, it gets back to the issue of um, uh, are, are these issues ethical issues or legal issues. Uh, so, uh, so in terms of um, uh, research with de-identifiable information and whether that's uh, uh, human subject research or not, I mean, uh, so in the US we have regulations uh, I don't think one necessarily needs a lawyer to help out IRBs to understand what the regulations are. Uh, many times the legal person won't be familiar with that. Uh, so I think it's, it's helpful to have a legal person to make sure you're know, following the law, but I think a lot of these issues, ethical issues involving the IRB, I don't think you need to have a, a legal person uh, involved with your recommendation. So this slide shows uh, an example of a governance structure for a biobank and all the different um, committees that are involved with the um, uh, biobank. 
And as we can see here on the bottom, a public engagement committee, quality management committee, data and sample access committee. Uh, so uh, essentially multiple levels of IRB review. It's not only uh, review of, um, of um, individual research protocols for the use of identifiable specimens and data, but we're talking about review of certain operating procedures and policies of the biobank. Uh, and uh, uh, let me, so let me, um, Let me skip these slides for the interest of time. Uh, right, so the, again, IRB oversight or research ethics committee oversight, uh, an important uh, role for the IRB is data access and dissemination. Is it cons consistent with the initial consent under which these specimens and data were collected? If not, and this is something you discussed in the previous example, if not, can and informed consent be waived uh, or is new consent required for, for the new research study uh, and uh, other issues, uh, determination of whether the research study itself is scientifically appropriately and consistent with the initial consent. So in that previous example, it just said future cancer studies and you all had brought up issues that uh, it, it didn't mention genetic research. Are there systems in place to reduce risk or harms to groups? Uh, could specimens be distributed without identifiers? Uh, and uh, also review of documentation of IRB approval from the recipient inv investigators themselves. Um, so the, um, the other issue involved is the issue about uh, data release or data sharing with um, um, between developing and developed um, countries. And we're talking about what's called genome-wide association studies. So essentially we have the concept where do we when, if you set up a biobank, are you going to be willing to share your data set with other countries who could who usually have the means to do, have the technology to do uh, advanced analysis of data sets? So will you allow your data sets not only be shared with other investigators in your country, but what about sharing data with uh, other countries? And, and the issue uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, these studies are done in high income countries and whether, uh, uh, and uh, essentially, do you want your data set to be shared to look for genetic variants 
among ethnic groups in, in your countries as well. Um, and so, um, so I just want to briefly talk about that. And as I said before, when we get into issues of data sharing, we have attention with privacy, protecting the rights of individuals and communities and enhance privacy, not only of individuals, but you know, family members and communities. And then we have the issue of, if you're gonna share the data from your communities, from your population, what are the issues with benefit sharing of the data? Uh, what kind of sharing of the benefits of the research? And not only intellectual property issues, but issues involving profits. And what about the protecting the rights of researchers and institutions who generate the samples uh, and will they be put at a scientific disadvantage? And what about, should there be, I mean, one of the reasons why it's almost like a one-way flow of data from countries who don't have the technology to analyze the data you give it to the high income countries. So should there be um, on the table, the issue of capacity building of developing world scientists so that one day you can analyze the data set yourself. So should that also be on the table in terms of benefit sharing? And um, another issue regarding the investigators in your country is, is the issue of authorship. Uh, so a local scientist, um, should they be involved in, in any aspect of the future research on, on the samples? Uh, should they be merely listed in the acknowledgement section, or should they also be authors if they are part, if they are part of the research itself? And also, what position of authorship should they be? And there's been studies being done looking at when authors from developing countries share in the research of these large data sets, what position on the list of authors do they hold? And how frequently are they the first authors on, on these papers? And uh, that's, that's been um, an issue involved uh, with authorship. And, and so uh, an issue that research ethics committee should be involved with on the dissemination of the data and the biospecimens is this issue of uh, material transfer agreements. And essentially it is now standard when tissue samples are transferred from one place to another. Uh, one of the handouts I disseminated uh, re regards a typical data transfer agreement from, from the UK. Uh, and what I briefly want to show you here is the, um, the data uh, transfer uh, or the material transfer agreement from, from India. And 
the next few slides merely lists uh, the items, typical items in a MTA, uh, the biomaterial to be transferred, the quantity, the purpose, the type of research, the safety norms to be observed um, in the um, uh, in the transfer agreements, uh, other stipulations, whether it be used for commercial purposes other than those stated in the agreement itself, uh, the uh, whether there'll be other users besides the collaborating institution. You know, one issue involved um, with the, um, uh, uh, when they had the Ebola crisis in Africa, that uh, a lot of samples were stored for future research. And a big issue was that investigators from the UK came, grabbed the samples, and the African countries who donated the samples ne never knew what happened with the samples that were given to the UK investigators. Uh, so the one issue in the MTA is whether the samples will be transferred to any other person or agencies and also um, patent issues uh, as well and uh, has to be specified in the, in the MTA. Uh, and then other issues uh, and uh, providing a yearly report and issues about publications, confidentiality uh, and duration of the MTA. So this is something again the IRB um, should be involved with developing uh, the MTA. And then let me end by just uh, bringing up some unresolved or challenging issues. And one of them is regarding the return of uh, results uh, and incidental findings. So return of research results, when should individual research results be returned to subjects? Uh, and that's a, a tension uh, involving the rights of individuals to have information about themselves. But on the other side of the coin, People are concerned about harms associated with inappropriate return of results. So what, what could be the downside of returning results? Should, should we, what, what could be the issues about returning results? Maybe some, some patients would require further care or further diagnostic tests. Oh, um, uh, what, uh, tell me more about further diagnostic tests. Like, for, the, for example, if some uh, results showed that there is a um, risk factor or a predisposition to a, a disease, so maybe they would need to be tested more or uh, to be uh, treated for a certain risk factor, for example. Um, okay, well then, um, so be it, right? So then they should have the right to that information. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, some, some of the results may cause some anxiety or may cause unnecessary uh, further uh, medical care or unnecessary testing, for example. It might not be cost effective. Yes, yeah. So. Right, yeah, so there's, uh, well, I mean, there's been the, 
uh, it has been brought up that there's a concern that uh, you return the results and individuals may not understand those results, uh, may, may cause unnecessary stress, anxiety, uh, may not have, or the results may have unknown clinical significance, uh, may not be relevant uh, to, uh, may, may not have any treatment options. Um, so there, in the past, there's been some concern about what is the, um, should we return all genetic results or only return genetic results that have clinical significance. And, um, and uh, so um, one time they did a study and asked, um, they, they looked at the informed consent forms and the consent forms had said, we will not disclose the results. And the reasons given for non-disclosure included meaning of the results would be unclear, would not confer a benefit, the tests are experimental, uh, non-disclosure would provide protection against discrimination. So if you don't disclose the genetic results, then there won't be a privacy risk. Um, it would be impossible because the data would be de-identified and also impl implications for family members as well. Um, um, now, having said that, um, and uh, essentially though, the practice of not giving individuals the results is actually now changing because there, there's the concept that people should know about their uh, uh, obligations to give results under certain conditions. Um, if the risk for the disease is significant, when the disease has important health or significant reproductive implications, or when proven therapeutic or preventative in interventions are available. So the, um, the concept is actually uh, been changing in the last five years that um, participants who donate their samples have a right to have their, to get their results uh, from the, um, uh, from, uh, from the research. So we saw in, in the Qatar consent form, it said it would return the results. Whereas in the UK, they said, we're not returning the results. The last issue I just want to bring up is the issue of ownership. So who owns when a participant donates their specimens or data to the biobank, who should own who should own the data? Biobank. The biobank. Because you donate it. If you donate, you give you give up your rights. Um, okay, now you're you're right. I use the word donate. Is that the right word to use? No. Depends no. If you, yeah, I no. because you can donate, so donation is called it's not yours anymore. You give it you give it away. No. No, participate. <laughs> I I mean, 
You're right. If it's a true donation, you're donating it. But is that the right concept? To well, if you, if, you, if you donate and you sign a, a broad consent form, then the, 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 the biobank is uh, ownership of the sample and the data. Okay, well, um, right, so but now- Still, so, still so, the rights to the, to the donor. What's all that? the rights kept, all the rights kept to the donor, even physically, the biobank might own physically the, the samples, but the rights, still kept for the donor for the but patient you sign the consent form to be used for multi-purpose study different studies throughout the years so you sign the form so do i have to go back to for every single still the rights still the rights kept to the donor to the participant donor whatever whoever well i mean should, should he be, has the um, right to go back and take uh, withdraw his uh, participant but you cannot uh, ask the result of the studies. Should, should the participant give up his or her rights to the sample? The right of result of the studies, you mean? Um, not the results. I mean, the results of the study, I mean, uh, I don't know what it means to own the results of the study, uh, but we're talking about um, control of the specimens. Uh, should they have ongoing, it's, it's similar to what we talked about before, when I talked about dynamic consent, uh, I mean, is it on one end of the spectrum, is it, I give you my sample, class, do what you want with it, I have no other involvement, uh, or is it ongoing involvement? It depends on what consent form I signed. Is it dynamic? Is it uh, broad? Is it well, clear? Uh, again, what should it be? I mean, should I should should we adopt for for, for biobank? I would I would I would suggest to have a broad broad uh, uh, consent form. Okay, and why do you say that? Because uh, my, because you're gonna save the sample for years and years, it could be 20, 25 years saving sample. So okay. I don't want to go back but, every single but, time we do a project to go back to the owner or to the- well, Who is the owner? I mean, not to the owner, I mean to the subject, to the person who donated. So once he signed the form, I have the right to use that, uh, the identify, the, identify the, uh, the tissue or the sample and the identify the, the data. Well, it, 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 it all comes back to who are the stakeholders in a biobank? Uh, government. Okay, the government. Well, Research pursuits, government. Uh, probably if it's a private biobank, then the government is not involved. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they may set up regulations, but they're not owning the samples. So it all, it all uh, comes down to uh, what kind of arrangement do you want to have with the people who give their biospecimens or the communities? Is it something like a shared enterprise between the communities and the managements of the biobanks. So it, it all comes down to what, what kind of partnership do you want with the um, 
with the people who give the samples? Is it, again, one end of the spectrum, they give the specimens and that's it? No yeah. other involvement? Then you would just want to have broad consent, give your consent to all future unspecified research, and no other control over what happens with the specimen or what kind of research. And the, um, um, and also um, this gets into issues, what happens when a patented invention is derived from the tissue samples. And so essentially the tissues are now commercialized. Do the participants also own the patent? as well. And are the participants entitled to share in the, in the financial benefits? And do they have a right to prevent the use of their tissues in the development of patented inventions or commercialized products? Now, on one hand, uh, let me, um, there's been several uh, case studies in the US, uh, court cases, in which the court have said, well, once, once the tissue leaves your body, you don't own the samples anymore. And, and the people who developed the tests the uh, interventions, the inventions, they use their uh, analysis and efforts to make the product and hence they own the patent and not the individual who donated the sample. And uh, so some people say, well, if you're going to go after that model, then you need to put something in the consent form. Exactly. You may depends want to the, say, it depends on the consent form. What did you sign on in the beginning? Okay, right. So one suggestion is if you think the participant should not have any rights, then you have to say that in the consent form, here's an example of such a statement. Discoveries made with your DNA may be patented by us and the universities, may be sold or licensed, and uh, royalties may be paid to us if we give it to another company. It is not our intent to share any of these possible royalties with you. So you have to uh, spell that out in the yeah. consent form, and this has to be approved by, by the IRB. Uh, now, having said that, there is a movement that the whole issue of ownership should be replaced by the concept of custodianship, where the biobank um, does not own the samples. They're merely a repository. They have a caretaking responsibility uh, where they, we talked about the um, governance and management and oversight and conditions for access and use. Uh, and uh, so the biobank is merely a custodianship and not an ownership, uh, which still brings up the issue, who owns the results result 
meaning any inventions that comes from the uh, use of the samples and, and the data. And uh, this, again, gets back to uh, community engagement. Do the communities partake? Are they an important stakeholder in the sense of contributing uh, to the um, uh, resources uh, for, uh, for any inventions that occurs? Um, and there's, to be sure, there is the concept that if an investigator views the samples and uses their technology and efforts to do something with the samples and come up with an invention, then that's their product. And just merely giving your sample does not necessarily confer control over what happens. However, there's control and then there's control. So on one hand, there is the concept that the community who partakes in the setup of the biobank and contributes the samples and the data, uh, on one hand, there is the issue of controlling what happens with the samples. And then there's the issue of who reaps any benefits from the commercialization of the samples. Um, and I think this needs to be sorted out on an individual level, individual meaning the biobank itself. And uh, I think it depends on whether the biobank is going to be a private biobank, uh, whether it's owned by a drug company, uh, whether it's in the public domain owned by the government. So let's say the Cutter Biobank, that's a government biobank. So what kind of involvement will there be by the community as opposed to uh, institution biobank? Uh, in the beginning of this presentation, I talked about there's many different types of biobanks. So we have private biobanks, we have institution biobanks, and we have public biobanks. And I think all these different entities will have a different governance structure uh, in terms of um, um, issues about control, ongoing control of the samples, and also issues about data transfer, biospecimen and data transfer that are, are also issues under control of the specimens and who manages what happens with the specimens and do you involve the community? And, and so I, I'm, just, I'm just saying is that um, there's a lot of issues that involves multiple stakeholders. You got the public, you got the investigators, you got the biobank managers, and then you got the government. And you have all these different stakeholders and you need to define upfront uh, what are the different obligations and roles and issues about management of the individual biobanks. And, and, and so 
no no one size fits fits all the different types of biobanks. So as you you guys mentioned last week about uh, the uh, UA, UAE and the biobanks. Now, I, I think there might be individual institutional biobanks in the UAE. Uh, uh, let me ask the question again. Are there biobanks in the UAE? There's no government biobanks. As Dr. Khawla said last time, there is a biobank and DHA for uh, core blood. Oh yeah, the cord blood, but that's yeah. a private biobank. It's for the Dubai, Dubai Health Authority, so even it's for the same people, it's for personal use, not right. for uh, right. research or anything. Yeah, right. So, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, right, right now, I think your IRB is dealing with um, secondary use of, well, let me ask you, uh, have you had protocols involving secondary use of previously collected specimens? Not to my knowledge. What's that? I can't recall that we have done this. <laughs> Ah, makes me wonder. Um, I mean, uh, uh, well, you've been involved with protocols involved with secondary use of data, right? Retrospective use of data, okay. right? But yes. not, but not specimens. Not specimens. Huh. Well, I mean, institutions are storing specimens. Uh, let me, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm surprised at having come across protocols in which investigators are wanting access to specimens. No, we, we do have protocol investigators uh, want access to specimens from the labs or from uh, patient samples or even medical records. But we do have uh, many, many research uh, from universities asking for uh, samples from the hospitals. Okay. So. so then it goes through IRB, but that's that's not secondary uh, research. It's primary. Uh, why is that primary? Because it's uh, the, probably the information, the samples, and uh, the, the the data is not de identified. Probably. Well, uh, well I'm talking about samples again. I'm talking about samples that were taken first. Previously obtained from patients for diagnostic procedures or yes. obtained for yes. a, a previous research study. No, for uh, samples obtained for diagnosis, and then the remaining could be used for some research. Right, yeah, that's secondary use. That's secondary use. Right, yeah. So it's it's not, I mean, maybe it's stored in a pathology department. Yes, they keep it at least for two months. If it's positive sample, they keep it for three months. Negative, they discard it in a week. So depends on the storage area. Then uh, that, was, that was one of, that's my question before uh, the end. I was going to ask you from your background, uh, to establish a, a, a biobank, it's a continuous, uh, long-term, sustainable project. Right. How much? How much would it cost to establish such things for a, some somewhere like okay, in Qatar, for example? Uh, since you they're working on that, how much budget is required to establish something like that for a biobank and database? Uh, well, it, it it depends on the magnitude of the operation. I mean, Qatar. 
uh, is involving 60,000 uh, individuals. Uh, and and oh, that, yeah. that's in the beginning, but it's going to continue. It's going to be a continuous process. It's going to be going to be infrastructure going to be built on built on continuously. Especially talking about saving all these samples and uh, uh, you need lots of infrastructure, lots of uh, storage areas, and lots of. Uh, that's uh, that's right. There's there's a lot of costs associated with uh, maintaining the quality of the samples. Yes. Uh, I, and. Um, uh, storage is issues, equipment, personnel. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. An, an average budget to establish something like this, how much would be? Uh, I don't know, but um, uh, you definitely need initial startup funding. Uh, I I know in Egypt there's been many institutions, universities who have set up biobanks uh, and they've gotten initial funding from the university or some government funds. Uh, and we're, we're talking about biobanks that have been um, in existence for about one or two years and they still haven't yet, I mean, how do biobanks make their money? It has to be a business plan, right? By utilizing, yeah, yeah. Even utilizing it as business. Either by by selling the or giving away the samples as a secondary. Yes, to, exactly. To yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and so. Uh, uh, none of the biobanks in Egypt have reached that stage yet about making money because you make the money by selling it to the researchers. Yes. Uh, and, and, and so, I mean, uh, Qatar Biobank is being sponsored by the government. Uh, Saying that, do you share the profit that you make from selling the, for a secondary with the primary subject? Uh, well, what's <laughs> that now? I said, since you were talking about commercialization, I said, if you use these samples and sell it to a secondary researcher as a pharmaceutical, and the profit that you're gonna make, are you gonna share it with the primary subject who donated the, or gave, gave the samples? Well, that, that's an issue that you have yeah, to address like, uh, in, in, in the beginning. So you may not want to share it because you need the money to support the biobank. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but um, the major point, and let me end on this point. Uh, the major point is that um, if the UAE or individual eminence uh, get in the business of uh, establishing a biobank, then the major point I want to get across is that there's a lot of, there's many ethical issues involved with the biobank and the IRB needs to be involved. They need to be involved with the informed consent uh, issues, privacy issues, who has access to the specimens. They need to review the type of research being done and see if it's congruent with the initial consent form and whether uh, one could waive the consent for certain types of research involving de-identified information. What are the ethical issues involved with return of results? What kind of arrangements should be made with the participants regarding withdrawal issues? Uh, so all these ethical issues 
involved with establishing a biobank, the IRB or some ethics committee needs to be involved with. But certainly uh, when an, an investigator wants to perform secondary use of these specimens, the IRB obviously needs to be involved and there's many different issues involved with the, with the consent, mm. the original consent when the uh, individuals uh, gave their uh, specimens for, for research. So uh, one, one me... uh, curious question, if you don't mind. Uh, I think in the West, there's lots of uh, banks, uh, for example, sperm bank or ovary banks, and then they use that for, for IVF, for example, or in vitro fertilization to conceive a baby, for example. So uh, well, that's, that's uh, them... But that's not research. No, that's not research, no. That's commercial. Right, yeah. So uh, this last slide here was in an article looking at different biobanks in different countries. And they uh, mentioned issues about sharing samples and, and data. Um, and, uh, uh, and they looked at data sharing, biobank impact assessment, education and training challenges. And, and Cutter said, there is availability of skilled staff. However, further educational opportunities are commonly uh, abroad and not local. And they say, um, in terms of challenges in CUTA, they say the alignment of the local guidelines for sharing data and sample needs to be strengthened. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, uh, Uganda says, improving mapping of biobanks operating in the country. So apparently in Uganda, they have many different biobanks. So anyway, there's a lot of challenges uh, regarding um, sharing of the data and education and training uh, issues. Uh, with the biobank. So let me just say that uh, these, a lot of ethical issues involved with establishing a biobank. And let me, uh, let me end uh, by saying there's a very useful society, ISPA uh, society, uh, if you just go to their website, all right, and uh, they have many good useful resources on their website. Let me just say that um, uh, it's, they have a special membership price for individuals from low and middle income countries, and they have a very good uh, educational resources at reduced prices for individuals from low and middle income countries. I, I guess the UAE is probably not considered a low and middle income country, but um, that's go to their web, website, ISBER, I S B E R. Uh, they have um, uh, very good, uh, useful resources, and and they also have this um, this PDF uh, file regarding um, best practices for biospecimen resources. Okay. So um, a lot of a lot of issues ethical issues regarding establishing biobanks. Final thoughts, comprehensive subject. Okay, 
All right. Very good. Okay. All right, good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, I'm I'm enjoying it too. Thank I you, Mary. Really appreciate interacting with you guys. Okay. All right, good. Well, Thank we'll you. see you next next good week. Good night, everyone. Thank okay. you, Professor Henry. Good night. Okay. Goodbye. Have have a good week.